Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Got to start off by saying thank you to everybody that responded to the offering on the alignment pin that uh, we put up on our website for the rotary table. The response was pretty good and thank you to everybody. Thank you for all your patience too. The offer actually went into a second manufacturing run and there was a delay. So if you don't already have it, trust me, it's in the mail. Trust me, it truly is in the mail. Anyway, today's presentation, I know I asked everybody which one of the rotary table parts that they would like to see done first, and overwhelming reply was number three, and no doubt about it, number three looks pretty cool and something that you wouldn't see conventionally done uh, on a milling machine, a non-CNC milling machine anyway, so that would have been my choice as well. So in preparing the demonstration, I thought of all the different features that the other two had to offer and the lessons to be learned from those. So unfortunately, I will cover number three, but I'm not going to cover number three first. thought I was going to, but I just can't bring myself to dive right into something high-end like that without covering some of the basics, so maybe it'll be a little bit clearer or you'll understand the, the degree of difficulty when you get to number three. I'm going to start with the flared spoke version because I think there's a lot of cool stuff going on with the flared spoke. I'm going to reposition the camera. I'm going to put it over top of the print, and I'm going to show you a couple of mistakes that... Uh, first timers, new users may encounter with their rotary table and then I'm going to show you some of the ways or some of the thoughts that you can process to determine which way you want to best approach your job. Got some new stickers on the wall here. If you've got a sticker for your channel and you want to see it up on my board, send it to me. I will put it up there. Uh, Chris checked in from the old man shop. It's nice to see that one come across. And let's put the camera the tripod, zoom in on the print and we'll show you the logic behind flared spoke version. This demonstration will show you how to cut the flared spoke configuration of the three models and it's relatively easy. We're going to assume and I'm telling you so it's really no assumption. The solid black line in the middle is perpendicular to the y-axis of the machine. We're going to clock it eight degrees. So we're now on the eight degree center here. And what that does is allow us to use linear moves to come down and create this radial feature in the bottom, sweep this wall, and create that radial feature right there. You can, if you want to, at this time, rotate the table into this position, which is about 13 plus degrees. I'm particularly uh, not thrilled about doing that right away. I'm going to do a 12 degree sweep, and when I do this side, I'll come back and blend it. That way I don't have to be splitting hairs with the rotary table as I turn. And it should be relatively quick. I'm going to try to run this real time so you get a feel for how long it takes. I may accelerate it, but uh, it's not going to change the amount of time that it actually takes. I'm not going to bore you with all that. So the first time, we're going to have to come down, shift the table 8 degrees, make the linear offset for the radius of the tool, and I'll be able to sweep these walls in here. When it comes back for the other side, I may have to shift to the top and do the same thing, offset, and then move counterclockwise. Okay, clockwise rotation to the table, clockwise rotation of your crank on your dial, at least on my machine, uh, you get positive incremental moves in your scale on your rotary table. So if you want to start with positive moves, you have to start so that the clockwise rotation of the table doesn't kill your part. Okay, let's get the tool set up over top of the correct location and throw some chips. As part of the demonstration today, I'm going to show you a way that you can work to hard numbers and not have to come up with a bunch of strange numbers on your chart because you're ultimately going to have to compose one. But I'm going to show you a way that you can find a point in space on a rotary table two different ways. First is you can exactly follow what they've got on the print where it says 24 degrees right there and 1 inch 875 radius down here in my cheat sheet. So we're going to move the x-axis of this machine 1 inch 875 and then we're going to go 24 degrees to bring that feature around directly under the cutter where it's supposed to be. Alright, there's 21, 2, 3, and 4. Boom. Now we're exactly over that spot. 
if you had to make an eight hole pattern 24 degrees off a of rotation with a one inch 875 radius you would now have to add 24 degrees to 45 then to 90 then to 135 then to 180 and all the way around so at any given time you're not going to have 45 or 90 or 135 or the numbers that you would expect to see in a symmetrical eight hole pattern so how do you get around that well let me show you how to get around that let's return this back to the starting place back to zero Let's just say that you're stubborn or you're persistent and you want to work with 45 and 90 and 135 as you go around this eight hole pattern, but the print layout really doesn't allow you to do that. Well, you make this move, you don't make this a rotary move, you make this a linear move. I'm going to fade out here for a second. And my wheel is exactly on zero here. Kind of in the dark, but you're going to have to trust me. Make this an XY move. Whatever the triangle works out to be, there's your triangle. If this were a true radius, this would be swinging around out here, of course. So there's your triangle. That is what we're going to do initially to reset this tool. Move it over. And linear, move it over. Now the table is still set on zero. Your tool doesn't know whether it got there with a 24 degree shift on the table or two linear moves. And now you can go zero to 45 to 90 to 135, making your eight hole pattern the way you would expect it to be dimensioned on the print, 45, 90, etc but you are 24 degrees off because you established that position with the linear move. Simple. We're going to use that technique today and we're going to erase a whole bunch of aggravation out of this spoked wheel, this flared spoked wheel, and we're going to make it look pretty easy. So let's put some material on here and get after it. Keep this in mind though, this is a really good thing to remember. Tucked in along the x-axis of the machine, I have my little cheater board right there. Masking tape and Dicom or, or Sharpie marker on it. And I am going to know at all times which side of the cutter I am on. Because sometimes it's pretty difficult to tell when you're looking at the part. Hey, do that. Don't be ashamed. It works really well. We're going to make the initial rotational shift to 8 degrees. Move the cutter down and over. Uh, 156 it's a 312 diameter cutter and we are going to have at it on the left hand side of the spokes all eight of them initially repositioned for the second side so stay tuned and we are going to probably fast forward all of this and when I reposition the tool I'll explain that as well
Okay, I am not quite sure what that is in real time. I believe it's somewhere around 12 minutes. And we are going to return the machine, re return the rotary table to the zero position, offset 8 degrees in the opposite direction, and offset the tool back to zero, and then an, an additional 156, which is the radius of the tool. So that will be the second move here. And we're going to take off this lump right there. And that will result in all the uh, pie-shaped cutouts and the final geometry of the spoke wheel will just form by default. I may reduce the center section of this and put a little cut around the outside just to dress it up a little bit and accentuate the cutout, but let's see what happens. There we go. Cutter is back on center. Cutter is offset 156 to the opposite side. Come back around for eight. When I return this to the original core diameter setting, which is 604 in my records, and having a digital readout is a big help on a situation like this. When I crank to my first position of 352 on the table, it should line up. And we're going to find out here in a second. All right, there's 352 locked down. 604. Now in order to keep with the climb cut mentality that I have been doing, which is if you saw me plunge it and then plunge it and then return to the first one and make the sweep, it's so that I could climb cut and have a clean outside. I'm going to do that same philosophy in reverse. So I will start all my cuts from the outside and move towards the core. So that will give me the climb cut geometry. Alright, let's see how long this takes. I have uh, 16 minutes showing as remaining film time. Let's see if we can knock it out. Okay, five minutes real time. Now I'm going to bring the cutter in to the original 604 dimension, which is the linear move over. I'm going to bring it into the 604, plunge it down about 80 thou, and I'm going to create a vertical hub on this so it looks like these spokes are offset. Then I'll do the same thing back here and remove the center. This is all going to be by eye relatively quick, so we'll fast forward through it and then pop the part out and see what it looks like. There you go. That is, uh, I'm pleased. And my handy dandy Cobra GoPro setup. Gonna shoot that in a, stick that in a different location real time. Let's refocus and uh, take a better look. Okay, you can see the 16 degree flared spoke in between the cutouts. 
very symmetrical. The burrs are at an absolute minimum here because of the climb cut nature of everything. Finish on the inside is relatively good. And I think I will probably change the cutter and let's plunge down through this a little bit and see if we can uh, create an OD on this part. That's just too pretty not to finish out. Hang in there for a couple minutes. There you go. Actually, I've elected to keep the 5 16 diameter cutter in here, and I'm just going to go around the outside and create a very narrow edge on the outside. Uh, enough to clear my clamps, but I'm probably going to get down to within an eighth or so of that, which is not exactly narrow, but let's see what happens. I am going to return the x-axis center line of my table to zero, which I think is important if you're looking for any type of critical diameter dimension. You're going to want to be on uh, a specific zero on your x. You can also do it with the offset, but it's easier on the, if everything's zero. And now for everybody that's wondering if I'm going to actually cut that completely out, yes I am. I'm going to use a technique that I like to call jump the clamps. I'm going to take one clamp out at a time and I'm going to remove that section of material in that area and return the clamp back to its original location. If you're confident, which I think I am because this is not a big heavy cut, remove the clamps at 180 degrees and cut this side and then go ahead and cut that side move the clamps into the finished product and then remove these clamps completely and finish the OD. If it's really critical then pressure turn it in a lathe and finish the uh, diameter so that it's cosmetically beautiful but that's uh, not for this demonstration or maybe it is, we'll see. Hang in. All right, before I remove any of the other clamps, I'm going to put the ones that I just jumped over, or excuse me, I'm going to re keep these here. I will return the ones that I jumped over and then remove those so I don't lose my location. Now if you wanted to do that all over again with the chamfer tool, have at it. Print calls it out, you got to do it, but at least you got your numbers. Alright, put it on the bench and check it out. Well this is the final result. I did take some creative cosmetic liberties off camera. Shined up the outside, ran it across the piece of emery blasted it, take off all the burrs, and if you notice there was a feather surface remaining here when I was taking it out of the rotary table, I did cheat and put it in a lathe and face off about 15th out to make sure that that back surface was completely gone. So that I didn't show, but it was minimal and it was done by eye for demonstration. Had it been a real part, I'd have paid more attention. So there you go. That is the flared spoke. It is not a big deal, but it is definitely something you need to pay attention to when you're doing it or it's going to bite you in the butt. Now I'm going to try to refocus and just show something else here that I think is really important for any machining operation and this is a perfect opportunity to point it out. So let me uh, zoom in on some of the inside features here and we'll get right back to you. This is a perfect example of what a, a load can do to a specific cutter. 
these features in the corner were plunged. This was a climb cut that came across here and because it was a climb cut it wanted to move in this direction. So when you load up a tool, any tool, an end mill, a, a lathe tool, whatever, and really load it up, if you were to go back over that surface it's either going to miss that surface by a mile because it dug in or it's going to take more material off. Because I did this in a single pass, when the cutter came down into the plunged area here and then came across, if you watch the video you'll see that this is a plunge, plunge, climb cut, and then a single climb cut across here. When it climbs, it is going to flex away from the surface, and that is what you're seeing right there. If this was a double pass, I could guarantee that wouldn't be there because the outer diameter here was done at the same setting as these holes were plunged, which is why you can see it's nice and tangent right here. It's real clean. It's a very light cut here, and this was an incredibly heavy cut here. And I'm going to bet that that's present on the majority of these windows, which it is. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is very uh, common when you plunge an end mill through a piece of material, steel, aluminum, whatever, and you're making a channel cut, and you're coming across that part with the, with the cutter, and you're going to see the cutter is going to want to flex out. So when you return, it's only going to cut off one side of the channel. And when you're done, the channel that you've cut there's a bunch of serrated steps on one side of the channel and the other side is perfectly smooth. That's because when you go up and back, the cutter is flexing back and forth with the load based on the rotation of the cutter. Anyway guys, that is the flared section. I am going to reload the rotary table and we're going to do the straight spoke, which is a whole lot easier I must say. And I'll show you how that's done. Now, I personally like the straight spoke or the uh, flared spoke better, but ideally these corners out here. Oh yeah, there's a burp, right? That's my fault. These corners out here should be nice and sharp. That would be ideal if I go back in there with a smaller end mill and it was actually looked like these things were segmented. Well, that's a something for another day. Hope you enjoyed what you saw. Thanks for watching. Alright, well I only spoke during that demonstration when there was really something to speak about, but I wanted you to see the whole thing come together, which is why I raced through some of the redundant window exercises. There is a lot going on with that particular, uh, not only that particular piece, but pretty much any piece you're going to put on a rotary table can get fairly complex. Remembering which side of the line you're on, the comp size, there's just so much going on. Make your lists. There's no shame in making a whole list of strange numbers. Uh, that only you will understand and please realize that when you want the cutter to go clockwise that doesn't mean turn the dial clockwise because that's just not the way it ends up the feature ends up going counterclockwise and if you don't plan your job you can be uh, you can be surprised pretty quick when you go and it's end of days anyway thanks for watching I will post the round one coming up here pretty soon so I hope you come back for that one and as always thank you very much Joe Pye Advanced Innovations Austin Texas I'm out